Hello, and welcome to lecture 22 of AMAP 502 at UAlbany. Today, we're going to revisit one of our first classification algorithms, namely that idea of I have a point cloud where I have two types of class labels, and I'm trying to separate them. I can try to do that using a hyperplane. We're going to see revisit this topic, view it as an optimization problem, and then motivate the broader definition of support vectors machines. So I'm going to go ahead and go into some of the more theoretical uh, concepts behind uh, the support uh, vector machine algorithm, specifically for SVC, where we're looking for linear classifiers. This goes underneath the heading of the separating hyperplane theorem, or sometimes called the hyperplane separation theorem. They're both names for the same thing. This motivates the notion of a convex hall because we want to make this theorem applicable to data. Uh, this allows us to revisit linear classification, and this time actually specified as an optimization problem, um, which is where we'll be able to actually figure out when are these lines more or less unique. Um, the idea of sort of softening our requirements so that we can deal with point clouds where we have two class labels that aren't linearly separable uh, motivates this notion of a soft margin. And then finally, we get to the question of, well, how do we separate data that has more complicated shape? Um, shape is going to be one of the driving things behind improving unsupervised learning methods in data science. So this picture basically describes in, in no words uh, how we actually can justify uh, the finding of a hyperplane that separates points that have two different class labels. And the theorem basically says that if I have these sort of two convex shapes um, and they don't intersect, then there exists a plane that separates them. Um, and so here we can see what this looks like in two dimensions where I have a separating line and the sort of normal direction for that line gives you what's called the separating axis. And when we found this, we're trying to look for the margin, which is basically the distance between this line and each shape. And we try to maximize that on both sides. This is a figure that's just from uh, Wikipedia. All right, so let's go ahead and, and try to understand the hyperplane separation theorem, sometimes called the HST in more detail. To do that, we first need to remind ourselves some definitions of basic terms. Uh, the first term is that of convexity. Uh, many of you have this notion of sort of convexity as something that looks like this, um, or maybe that's concavity. Um, but let's go ahead and define precisely what we mean in the setting of subsets of Rn, Euclidean space. So a subset A is called convex if for every pair of points in that set, we have a line segment, straight line segment, that connects those pair of points. And that entire line segment also lies inside of A. That's the definition of a, a convex set. Let's also remind ourselves of the notion of a hyperplane. Technically, this is the notion of an affine hyperplane because normally if we think of hyperplanes, we think of them as linear subspaces of some vector space of co-dimension one. Uh, this necessarily requires that the plane pass to the origin. When we allow ourselves to talk about affine hyperplanes, that means we can transport or translate this subspace so that it doesn't pass to the origin. Anyhow, an affine hyperplane is defined to be the set of solutions to this equation. So f of x, which is defined as taking our vector x and rd, taking a dot product with some d-dimensional vector beta, and then adding some constant beta zero. And we want that this operation, beta zero plus beta dot x to equal zero. So beta dot x equals zero is essentially the equation for defining a hyperplane. Beta is in this setting, what's called the normal vector that defines the hyperplane. It's normal, it means perpendicular. By adding beta zero, um, we're essentially still requiring that there uh, be a set of solutions that, that's orthogonal to beta, but we have to add in the particular solution, whatever beta naught is, 
And this essentially just measures how far from the origin we are moving in, in the direction beta. All right, so we can now state the hy separating hyperplane theorem. And it says this, so if A and B are two disjoint, that means they don't intersect, non-empty convex subsets of RD, then there exists a vector V and a real number C such that if I look at X bracket V, and this right here is just shorthand for, or another way of writing X dot V is greater than or equal to C, and y bracket v, or basically y dot v, is less than or equal to c whenever x is in a and y is in b. So what this just says is that if I take a point in a, let's call that x, and I look at the dot product with this guaranteed to exist vector v, and that dot product is greater than c, and that dot product has to be greater than c. And moreover, whenever I take a point in b, Let's call it y, and I take its dot product with v, then that dot product has to be less than or equal to c. So this essentially guarantees that I have a decision rule, which says, suppose I get a point in Rn, I want to know if it lives inside of A or B. Well, one thing I can do is look at the dot product of v, look at its value, compare that with c, and then that's going to be my decision procedure. Um, for classifying whether or not a point belongs in the set of points labeled by A or the set of points labeled by B. All right, so I've purposely introduced these two different forms of notation because you, you'll see them as you go through um, your studies. So I just want you to make sure that you can understand how to translate or connect. How does this equation, beta zero plus beta dot x equals zero, relate to this equation. So the real question is, how does this definition of a hyperplane, an affine hyperplane, relate to this one? Well, it's actually very simple. Uh, here you want to think of the vector v as this vector beta. And you want to think of this angle brackets notation as just different notation for the dot product. And so to finally complete this, we can rewrite this equation as beta dot x equals negative beta zero. And so that means that C corresponds to negative beta naught. All right, so hopefully you got that and you can now know how to switch between these notations regardless of what book you're looking at. All right, so I purposely phrased the consequence of the separating hyperplane theorem um, to make it more of a classification problem. Points in the set are, can be labeled with whatever class label I'm using to denote points that are in set A. And I can use the class label for points in set B to then label points that have a dot product that's less than or equal to C. But almost never do we have data that's truly convex. Um, Instead, we deal with these sort of scatter plots of points. And those are very obviously not convex. Take two points that are in your data set. It's very unlikely that the whole line is going to be covered by points in your data set. So what we have to do is basically massage our data set to be something that is convex. So one way of doing that is to look at what's called the convex hull of a collection of points xi inside of whatever your d-dimensional feature space is. So the convex hull is by definition the smallest convex set containing the points in your set A. And here I'm thinking of A as just a sort of point cloud. So it's just a bag of points. It's not like a continuous uh, shape like we've been drawing with that first picture. So the convex hull is then basically the operation we do to apply to a point cloud to then create a convex set. It's called a convex hull because it's by definition a convex set. And in fact, it's the smallest convex set containing all your points. So what that means is that if I have a point cloud where I think of all those points as being labeled by some label, let's call it A, and I've got another point cloud, collection of points, my point cloud labeled by some label B, 
then I can take their convex hulls and then ask, do their convex hulls intersect? If they don't, if they don't intersect, then there exists a separating hyperplane. And we call those points linearly separable. Okay, so let's go ahead and visualize some of this using some Python. So here we're using some operations given to us from the SciPy um, library, including convex hull and convex hull uh, plot. So right now we're just gonna randomly generate um, 30 points in two dimensional uh, space, so R2. And then we call the convex hull class with our points um, and that's going to create an instance of this object, um, which we're calling a hall. Hall is going to have various attributes, which we'll see shortly. But let's just bring that into memory again. All right, so every time I run it, it randomly generates. So expect this shape to change once I run shift enter again. Let's just check. We've got a corner here. Let's see if it's there in the next iteration. Okay, it moves slightly. All right, but that's just a reminder that every time we run this code, because they're randomly generated, the shape's gonna change. All right, so what is happening in this code block? So we're looking at you know, our, our normal matplotlib.py plot, which we imported as plt plot. And do we plot dot plot? And then we look at our points and we step through and we pet plot all the X coordinates. So that's done by putting that free slice notation that like runs down the, the column uh, in the in position zero. So all the rows in column zero and all the rows in column one. So that basically extracts out the X and Y coordinates of points. And it's plotted with this little round shape here. Um, you know, we could have always changed this. This gives us a slightly different shape. Yeah. But, oops, not zero. Oh. Um, but now we have this additional for loop. Um, and so this is just a dummy variable, but it's a meaningful dummy variable. They're calling it simplex. Um, and it's saying for, you could could have, could have said i, for i and hall that simplices. Now this is, this tells you that there's some attribute of our convex hall object. So just remember, we do have this convex hall object which was created using the points as the vertex sets. And so that's hall, all that's encoded in hall. Now, if we look at all the simplices in hall, and I wanna think of, you wanna think of the simplices as essentially being just edges between points inside of your, uh, inside of your data set. And what does it do? Well, it then plots well, it got, takes a simplex and then it retrieves an entry, which is indexed by simplex, and then whatever the first entry is in the column. And then it does the same thing and looks at this, the second entry, which is essentially going to be like the, what looks like kind of an X and Y coordinate. But let's try to understand better what's going on. So when I run hall.simplices, what it's returning is actually labels for points in my 30 random points. And it's saying that I've got a point 27, which corresponds to uh, one of the corners here. And notice that I've got roughly um, three, six, 10. So I have 10 edges inside of my convex hull. And so here they're actually referring to the boundary of the convex hull which is fine because the boundary uniquely determines the convex hull because you just fill in everything inside of here. And let's just count. So we have one edge, two edge, three edge, four edge, five edge, six edge, seven edge, eight edge, nine edge, 10 edge. So we do have 10 edges. So in this case, the simplices, there are 10 simplices. These are 10 edges, which correspond to the boundary of this, the convex hull of this point cloud. Now, what is happening here when I look at Call that simplices, and I look at an entry simplex. So let's look at the first one, right? So it's just like, all right, so that's zero. So it's like 
our first entry in our this list of simplices. And then it says, all right, let's use that and then access the zero position. So let's write this code. Paul, that simplices, comma zero, comma zero. Ah, huh, great. So this is actually gives us the X, Y coordinates. And it looks like it is 0 0.924, 0 0.924 for the X coordinate and 0.97 uh, for the for the Y coordinate. So it looks like it's it's basically this point right here. Uh, and then that points to one, which corresponds to 0.59 um, and then 0.36. All right, so that doesn't quite work, but um, it's all right here, 0.36. All right, so maybe it takes a little bit more puzzling out to figure out exactly what's going on here. Uh, but the point is, is that this generates the convex hull and it plots it by essentially connecting the dots in this edge. And it does that using a black line, which you know using that K attribute. All right, so let's go ahead and look at this um, in uh, another example where we now have two types of points. So we have red points and yellow points. So again, we're using this make blobs function which is provided to us from sklearn datasets and samples generator. And basically just sort of, again, we fix the random state. It's going to draw 50 points uh, from each of these with two centers. And then it's going to give us some notion of what's our standard deviation or our variance. This also is like the variability when we talked about k-means. So, so that's our, our collection of red points and yellow points. And so, first of all, we want to be able to understand how those red points and yellow points are, are determined. Uh, right now, we have x and y, which is essentially just going to be a bunch of x points, sorry, a bunch of points stored as x, and then a bunch of class labels, which is what determines our color. It's going to be 0 or 1. And notice this line here when we do plot.scatter. C equals Y says color according to the class label, which is some number between zero and one in this case, because we only have two, uh, two centers. All right, so, so the question is, we've got a bunch of labeled data and we know that one color corresponds to class label zero and one color corresponds to class label one. But we don't know how make blobs generated these. So let's try to figure out how we might be able to do that. Maybe before we even, even do this, let's just print x and see what the output of this code is. OK, so x looks something like this, 1.1415, 1.18163, 1.432437, 1 so on and so forth. OK. All right, well, we already recognize, I think, one of these entries, the 1.432, 4.37. That corresponds to the third entry in here. And then we've also got, it looks like the fourth entry is also in there, maybe the, but not the fifth. So these data points are sort of all mixed up inside of X. So what we need to do is run through and extract out the points inside of X, which have a given class label. And so the way we're going to do that is the fact that we've got X, which encodes the X, Y coordinates, and we've got Y, which encodes the class labels. And so I'm just going to do a simple for loop where first I, I create two NumPy arrays. And I know that I've drawn 50 samples. 25 of them are going to be of one class, and 25 are going to be the other. And so I'm going to go ahead and just update the entries of P0 to be, all right, I step through the 50 entries in X. If my entry inside of Y, which corresponds to that same entry num index in X, 
So if y i equals zero equals equals zero, that means I'm going to think of that as say uh, a red point. I'm just going to call it a, a p zero point. Um, and then I can add that at the jth index where I've initialized j at equal to zero. And I say that, all right, p zero j uh, colon, which this just means I'm reading off both the x and y coordinates because I'm looking at both entries in the column. This says that the jth row of p zero is equal to the i row of x because I know that that i row of x corresponds to an x, y pair whose class label is equal to zero. And so I pin that to, pay, uh, I just add that to P zero and then I increase my row index. So this is very simple code. Since I only have two different class labels, um, I can just write this as an else statement and then say that all their points are gonna to correspond to P one. And then you have a separate counter for how I'm stepping through the entries in P one because these are gonna fill up at different times. But anyhow, this provides a way of extracting out our, uh, our points with class label zero and our points with class label one. Now, I encourage you to think about how you might do that differently. There are, for example, um, functions or methods inside of NumPy, which just can basically populate a whole array based on entries where this class label is equal to something. So make sure you understand this code because this could it'd be something you could do in a pinch if you don't remember the special function. Um, but also maybe you try to beef up your NumPy knowledge and see how you might extract that out automatically. All right. So we've got our P0 and we've got our P1. And so again, we have to call instances of this convex hall uh, class where we feed it these vertices, P0 and P1. And I call this object hall of P0 and hall of P1. Again, it's good to have meaningful variable names. All right, so maybe just for the sake of our understanding, we can now figure out which one of these guys was P0. Okay, it turns out that P0 was the red points. Um, nice, so we were able to identify that just by tinkering with our code. Again, it's the way you have to learn, is you have to tinker with these things. All right, great. And so you can also try to step through and make sure you understand how this code was. I think the reason what wasn't working is that maybe we're reading across and not down as we, as we should. Um, but anyhow. All right, so. Let's just revisit why we are doing all of this. So we're giving, let's say, as training data, some red points and some yellow points. And then if we're given a new point, we want to decide, is it a, should it be labeled red or should it be labeled yellow? So first of all, the formulation of whether or not we can separate and come up with a linear classifier comes down to whether or not we can take the convex hull of our red points, the convex hull of our yellow points, and apply the hyperplane separation theorem. And one thing you need to be careful of, and it's just part of like being a someone who's sort of sophisticated with mathematics, is figure out, ah, the separating hyperplane theorem only guaranteed existence, but not uniqueness. That just basically means we know that there is a, a hyperplane, but we don't know if there's a unique one. And in fact, it's easy to see that there's not going to be a unique one. I can draw lots of different lines which separate red points on one side and yellow points on the other. And this just goes to prove that. Uh, again, the basic method of plotting things where you first create, you know, your set of X points, and then you can plot several different lines at different slopes. And that's essentially what's happening here. X fit is your X coordinates and then your Y coordinates are the equation of this line. And you're doing it for your pair of slope and Y intercept iterating through this list. So again, very clear code, but make sure you understand this and read this. And so you can figure out how you might want to do this more generally. All right. So great. 
we just went through some of the theoretical justification of when do we have a linear classifier, but which we're thinking of as a separating hyperplane. Now, one thing we need to do is, is also figure out how do we see how good of a model this is? You remember that when we talked about the train model predict paradigm, inside of that modeling step, we wanted to have uh, some performance evaluator. How accurate was our model? And how can I tune the parameters in my model so that I get the best possible performance given the hyperparameters that govern my model? So let's try to review that real briefly here. And we'll again introduce some language. And this is where we use our, think of beta zero, beta D as being our shift plus our beta vector. And so let's just take the condition that um, we're gonna call red points as having the label one, even though in the code it was actually zero. Um, but right now we're gonna look for a slightly different thing. So we're gonna say yi is equal to one for all the red points and all and yi is equal to minus one for all the yellow points. I here indexes your sample. So remember we had 50 samples when we did our make blobs example. And so it says that for some of these rows, I'm gonna assign this variable. Instead of using zero or one, I'm gonna use one and minus one. All right. Then the separating hyperplane theorem guarantees this collection of parameters where if I take the dot product and I add beta, that's gonna be greater than zero for all the points that were labeled red. So I'm gonna say red is if this equation is positive. And I'm gonna say yellow if this equation produces something that's negative. Alternatively, there's a really slick way of combining both those conditions in just one equation. And that says, all right, take yi and then multiply it by this equation. And this is where using that one minus one is really good because when this was negative, you know, negative times a negative number is a positive number. So then all we're actually looking for is uh, parameters beta zero through beta D, where this product is always greater than zero for all I iterating through our samples. So again, I've been using the language implicitly, but here we can define it again precisely. So what I just wrote specifies what's called a linear classifier model which we can use to predict whether a test point is red or yellow. So the basic setup is like this. We've created this model. This model is governed by these parameters, beta zero, beta one through beta D. And my method for prediction is that I've taken a test data point, something in my test set. I evaluate this function on that test set and if that function is positive, then I declare it a red point. If it's negative, I declare it a yellow point. But that doesn't give us a way of assessing the quality of our model. It allows us, it doesn't give us a way for updating how can we choose beta zero, beta one, beta D to make this better. Before we can even talk about better, we need metrics, meaning we need ways of assessing quality. Um, and this is done using something called the margin. So, if R is a set of red points and Y is a set of yellow points, then to each separating hyperplane, beta zero, beta one through beta D, again, those are the D plus one parameters required to specify a hyperplane, an affine hyperplane. That's our normal vector. And this is our displacement from the origin. So then to each separating hyperplane and this associated test function, this is our rule for deciding, we define its margin to be the minimum value that the absolute value of this function obtains on our red and yellow points. Now, if you think carefully about this, all it's saying is that I'm gonna look for what point is closest to my line, to my hyperplane. And that tells me basically the margin of error. If I were to perturb the plane by this amount, I might overshoot that point and no longer be able to uh, predict correctly. And so let's just go ahead and see how this margin works in those three different lines which separated our red points and our blue points. 
So you can see for this line right here, the one I'm tracing with my cursor, this is a very thin margin because its closest point is relatively close. This line that's got a steeper slope, larger M value, uh, has the next worst margin. Uh, it's a little bit larger, but not as small as the margin here. And that again comes from touching this point right here. Now, what happens for this line here is it's got the largest spread. So meaning that it's got the largest margin of error so that if I were to toggle um, my axis or toggle this displacement along the separating axis by this amount, I'd still be able to separate red points and yellow points. And that's what we want. We want the largest margin of error. So margin becomes our proxy for determining the quality of a linear classifier. All right, so this now allows us to finally frame uh, our linear classifier, our support vector classifier, as we'll later call it, um, as an optimization problem. Just like when we looked at least squares regression, that was defined as going to be the equation which minimized the least sum of least squares or the sum of squared errors that had the least squared error. All right, so what do we have? So in our train model predict paradigm, we have this nested subroutine. How do we update our model until we've maximized some score function or maybe minimize some penalty function? For regression, we are trying to minimize the sum of squared errors. In this case, we're trying to maximize the margin. So the maximal margin classifier is the binary linear classifier. So binary just means we have two labels, red or blue, or yet red or yellow, uh, that maximizes its margin on the training data set. This can be written as this convex optimization problem. So don't worry too much about this, but if you've taken something like a linear programming class or linear optimization class, you might know that there are sort of convex relaxations of those. And so essentially our goal is to do this. We're trying to maximize M. M is defined to be the margin of whatever linear classifier we're looking at, which is determined by this parameter beta, which includes beta zero, beta one through beta D. So it's a vector inside of D plus one dimensions, subject to the constraint that when I take the sum of these squared entries inside of beta, this equals one. Now you might ask, you know, what is that all about? Um, so the bottom line is that if I have a normal vector that's sitting orthogonal to my hyperplane, I can always scale that and make it arbitrarily large. And so that's not very good because it's going to end up affecting our sort of search space for solutions to this optimization problem. It's going to make it unbounded. And what we want to have is something that is bounded. So, so one way to do that is just to look at unit normal vectors. Um, and that's notice that in particular, we're only summing over the J one through D. So this is just affecting the normal vector. It's not affecting the displacement. So this is just asking that our normal vector be a unit normal vector, meaning is length one. And this is all that goes into specifying that this is actually is a linear classifier and that um, it's bounded from below by the margin. Because again, the margin was defined to be the minimum value of this function uh, when evaluated on test points or training points. So I'll just say that this is a hard problem to solve by hand, but luckily we've advanced a lot as a society where we've been able to come up with methods for solving this. All right, and this is exactly what SVC does. So SVC is Python, specifically scikit-learn's version of a linear classifier. And so notice that that means we have to invoke this class SVC and in, in the setting we've just been talking about, we use what's called a linear kernel. So we're gonna to get to a definition of what kernel is later today. Um, but right now, linear just refers to the fact that we're looking at this dot product model. Um, 
and also this parameter C we'll explain later today. This has to deal with something called the margin. And so like in our data science pipeline, once we've created an instance of this model, we have to apply our fit function on the training data. So we just did that. And so here's some more extensive code, which essentially goes through and, and plots what happens with this sort of decision function here. I'll leave it for you to like read this and try to understand it in greater detail. Um, again, one of the best exercises for learning how to code is to take a code that you've never seen, tinker with it, read it, try to understand it. All right, so when we apply that here, we've got the following. And so part of that code body was essentially, we draw actually our separating hyperplane, which is just a line in this case. And then we draw what the line looks like when displaced by the margins. Um, and you'll notice that in this case, there are a couple points that it touches. So it looks like it touches this and maybe this. But you can always ask the question, how many points does it need to touch in order for that to be truly stabilized? So kind of think about that problem, but I think I'll bring it up again later. But the bottom line is that here, what we've done is we've taken our points, we've used an instance of SVC with a linear kernel. This is again, Python's version of coming up with a linear classifier. We're able to find the best separating hyperplane defined as one that has maximum margin. And this function allows us to actually plot and view this margin. So this gets us to the definition of what a support vector is. And thus where all these terms like SVC and SVM come from. So this comes from von der Plas, our Python data science handbook. It says that this dividing line that maximizes the margin <clears throat> between the two sets of points. Notice that a few of the training points touch the margin. These points are the pivotal elements of this fit and are known as the support vectors and give the algorithm its name. So the points where the margin touches um, are the support vectors. And that's what gives the algorithm its name. In scikit-learn, we can identify these attributes, um, identify these points using this support underscore vectors underscore attribute. So let's go ahead and just see that here. So we just define our instance of our SVC model. And when we run it, we get, all right, 0 0.4435, 311. All right, let's see if we can go back and, and, and see that 0 0.45311. So 0 0.45311. I'll just move like this guy right here. 0, 04, oh yeah, and then there's 2.3 and 2.06 is my x coordinates, and then 3.4 and 1.9 as my my y coordinates. All right, so 2.33, 206, so 2.33 and 3.4. That's going to be our next margin or support. All right, so that's my other red point. So essentially, these three points are the support vectors inside of my data set. And so it seems like three points is what actually defines this maximal margin when we're looking at uh, a separating hyperplane in R2. All right, so let's go ahead and look at how this behaves um, through the addition of points. All right, so I think that was all I wanna say there. So you can see here that if I have those three points in my in my support vector. Um, I can add in a bunch of points, and if you know these blobs have some sort of centroid that's around here, in a relatively tight standard deviation, we had something like 0.6, I think. Um, yeah, 0.6. Then when we even double the amount of samples, uh, they're likely to be added here or here. Uh, and what that means is that the support vector doesn't really, support vectors don't really change. 
So this is actually one of the great benefits of uh, support vector machines is that the support vectors, which is what's really needed to specify the model, um, is relatively stable underneath the addition of more points. All right, but let's, we can actually explore that here. So here, if I've only got 10 points, um, you know, these are my support vectors. Uh, in this case, it looked like only two points were necessary. Um, so here we've got got three. Ah, then we added a bunch of points, so those shrunk. But now it's what happens when we go to 150. Okay, it changed a little bit. I think those two support vectors remain the same, and then this one just changed. And then 300. All right, and so again, we have these three, three points here as our support vectors. Um, so this gives you an idea of how this uh, model evolves underneath the addition of more points. All right. So we have to go ahead and confront the reality that data is rarely as nicely generated as what we get from make blobs. In particular, we might have data which is not linearly separable. Um, that is to say, linearly inseparable. You cannot separate them. Inseparable, cannot separate. Um, and so what that means is that if we think of the consequence of the hyperplane separation theorem, it's that I can't find that their convex hulls must intersect. So just remember, let's think about it. So disjoint implies uh, linearly separable. Uh, if not linearly separable, then not disjoint. All right. So this is called logic, this thing that goes at P implies Q to not Q implies not P, it's modus tollens. So one way to get around that is to basically relax. Um, and so we can deal with what's called soft margins. And this is essentially going to be um, our, our ability to allow some points to land on the other side. And so in, in optimization language, um, this is sometimes done via the introduction of what's called a slack variable. And so we can now define the support vector classifier with soft margins to be a, the optimal solution to the following optimization problem. So again, we're trying to maximize this, this M, which we think of as a margin, so at the closest point. But if the closest point's on the other side, then you know we're we're real, things are a little different. Um, and so let's see how we handle that. All right, so this just normalizes our, our vectors. Now, the difference comes from the fact that when I look at this dot product and I add beta, you know, remember our linear classifier was that we want this to be positive for red points and negative for yellow points. Um, and if we use y as being positive one or negative one for red and yellow respectively, then that means that that this expression should be always greater than or equal to zero. So what we can do now is introduce this uh, epsilon i, which essentially gives us some slack so that we can possibly deal with something that ends up being negative. Um, so we just ask that this is greater, not just than the margin, because uh, again, the margin was defined as the minimum value of this expression, uh, at least, which is supposed to be always positive, um, we now realize that, okay, sometimes this expression might be negative and we wanna allow for that. And so in particular, uh, we require that all the entries in epsilon i be greater than or equal to zero so that this number doesn't become, you know, uh, positive. That's not gonna, that's gonna be not slackening, it's gonna be strict, strictening. Um, and then we just ask that the sum of these entries be less than C. So, so C was exactly the thing that we specified when we did our instances of SVC, um, where we, that governs how soft our margins can be. So if C is large, we allow more points to land on either side. All right, so let's walk through the convex hulls and the support vector classifier.
All right, so here's an example where we made make blobs, but by increasing the standard deviation, we guaranteed that we got points which were not going to be linearly separable when I looked at their convex hulls because their convex hulls must intersect. All right. So we run through the same thing where I extract out the red points and yellow points in this example. And now I create their convex hulls. So just to run that again to make sure we got it. So we can see very clearly these points were not linearly separable. Um, and in particular, as a consequence, their convex hulls intersect. And so again, you can see here that now we can let C be uh, some parameter. And again, this tends to be pretty large just because we're summing up a bunch of points um, and we need these values to be greater than one. Um, this gives us an idea of just how much slack we need. All right, so we do that and we set that as our, as our margin. And again, we've got that function that was defined earlier, which you can read the plot SVC decision function. And so what this does is now gives us um, these sort of pivotal elements still, there are support vectors, uh, but where we acknowledge that, you know, some points are gonna cross the boundary. And you can see that here. So this yellow point looks to be on the other side of this boundary. And this red point is obviously on the wrong side of the fence. Um, and so this just tells you that SVC is actually a pretty flexible method when you introduce the slack or the, the soft margins parameter. All right, so we've been talking a lot about data where we assume there's a hyperplane or if there's not a hyperplane that truly separates, we can at least separate most of the data. But there's obviously gonna be plenty of instances in data science where points aren't linearly separable. Um, you might even try to think of some examples earlier. Uh, I think the iris data set was an example which couldn't be really well separated uh, linearly, but with K and N, uh, you, could, uh, you, could do, you could do better. Anyhow, another example of where you aren't gonna have points which are nicely, or at least obviously linearly separable is where you look at say, you know, you have a strong urban center inside of, you know, the Midwest, like, I don't know, Omaha or something like this. And then you think of there as being a rural or suburb ring around this dense city uh, center. So if we were trying to classify urban versus rural in these sort of settings, you know, we don't expect a linear decision function to work. Instead, we need something that can, you know, carve out a parameter that looks like a circle and say if you're inside the circle you're urban if you're outside the circle you're rural so that just means we need more complicated shapes uh, and let's see how we can do that again here's an, exactly the example i was just just discussing um, so i've gone ahead taken some yellow points that are very clearly centered and then uh, some red points which are uh, not so clearly separated. And notice this is again comes from a data set samples generator uh, called make circles inside of inside of scikit-learn. All right and again you ran run through the same thing. So here if I, I chose myself to have a linear classifier, that's what I mean by CLF classifier, um, that means I'm doing SVC with the kernel being linear and then I apply this fit method and I can actually put all that together in one line. Normally I separate that out into two lines, but actually I can do it all in one. And so this obviously doesn't go, this isn't gonna work. So here's maybe a crazy thought. So what you can do instead of trying to separate in two dimensions is to somehow transform the data so that it's separated, separable in three dimensions. And so you can actually see that here. So part of the, part of the reason why this works is I'm gonna use a function where I'm looking at the sort of maybe radial distance. And so now I'm gonna to try to pick a point and then graph radial distance. And that radial distance is gonna be higher for points that are farther away and lower for points that are really closer closer to there. So the idea is that things that with high value are suddenly gonna be out here 
and things with low value are going to be down here, and you can separate this way. And that's exactly what happens here. And so this doesn't always work super well, but um, if I were to try to run it, let me go ahead and back up here. Maybe do elevation here. All right, so for whatever reason, this uh, plot doesn't seem to be working as well as I wanted it to. It might just be that it needs some time to catch up. Um, All right, but I'll move ahead and then see if maybe that works here. It's possible I need to step out of this uh, notebook mode. All right, well, my apologies that this isn't working. It, it's always had very um, uh, sort of iffy performance. But I think the picture was already kind of clear that you have these yellow points here. And then when you plot according to radius, points with higher radius value are going to be up here. And then you can slice through this way. Um, again, I don't know why this isn't work. Oh, here we go. Good. All right, so let me, let me change that to 90. Huh. Oh, I think I tried this, didn't run this. All right, let's try that. Huh. And then can run this. Huh. Well, I have no idea why it's going, going all sorts of wonky on me right now. All right, so that makes my circles. That's X and Y. Maybe I should just kernel restart and clear output. All right, and then I'm going to run from here. All right. All right, I didn't run this. SVC. was my interactive widget here. This takes a little while to load. I just stop the kernel. This, and then I'll run this. All right, so again, I'm going to restart and run all. Cool. All right, so it seems to be running. Perfect. All right, great. Sorry about that. Uh, but you know, this is the nature of coding. Um, so if I if I try to work with this example again, um, there we go. Finally, finally, finally. So you can see here, and I'll zoom in. I've taken the points that look like a ring from above, and I was able to separate them out in a way 
that they could be separated by a hyperplane that let's say passes through r equals 0.7. All right, so I hope you think that the weight here was worth it. Um, all right, so let's go back and enter our slide mode and continue. So we now finally get to the title of this lecture, which is SVM, Support Vector Machines. And the question is, well, I've talked about support vector classifiers, but what is the machine here? Why is a machine different than a classifier? So basically what makes support vector machines a more general concept than just a support vector classifier, which I can think of as being sort of normally in my linear setting, at least when I pick, let's say, the linear kernel, as I'll explain, is that the machine steps through various ways of featureizing your data. And remember, featureization is one of the most important and difficult tasks in data science. This is how you take your samples and then turn them into points in a vector space where you can apply all these different methods. And, and so the case we just saw, the extra feature which helped to distinguish our points was to look at this sort of, let's say, negative of the radius. Because um, that was the thing which we could tack to a point, give it another point inside of RD. Now we have RD plus one because we're adding another feature. And then this additional feature is what allows us to separate uh, our data and use an ordinary linear classifier. But of course, how do we know we picked the right function? How do we know we picked the right feature? And it would be very tiresome to try to do all that at once. So essentially what puts the machine in support vector machines is code which automatically steps through standard choices for featureizing your data. And so you don't have to do that laboriously on your own. So that is basically what makes SVM um, special is it, it takes automatic operations that featureize your data and looks for good linear classifiers. And you can also see why my computer was working so hard is because it was basically going through and trying to featureize all those points. So these features fit into a, a more general mathematical concept called a kernel. Um, and of course there are kernels of like linear maps, but this is a different kernel. Um, so it's unfortunately an overlap in terminology for things that mean very different things. So in this case, a kernel is a function, which in the example we just looked at, where we look at the negative radius, what it does is it takes in a pair of samples and then it spits out a number. And so this is the procedure through which we basically featureize our data, or at least use it to sort of create new distance features. Um, and so what we think of this kernel as being is actually consisting of two things. So first of all, you need to figure out a way to featureize your data. So we can think of that as fee, fee for feature, that takes your samples and puts them inside of a vector space that's equipped with this notion of inner product. Inner product is the same thing as dot product. And so once we put our points inside of this uh, vector space with this inner product, we can then take the vector representation, one point vector representation, another point, take their dot product and get a number out. And so this kernel is then just the number that we associate to each pair of these points. And so this is what really makes um, kernels a remarkable thing is it ends up just being able to work on choosing pairs of points and then uh, providing a number. And that number we need to think of as coming from the dot product of some automatic feature engineering. So what we had just been discussing for most of this lecture uh, involved basically looking at uh, a particular type of kernel where the points already were uh, given to us as points in a vector space. And we could just use the Euclidean norm but now we think of this, the sort of alpha i as being the thing uh, 
which weights these, these dot products in a specific way. Um, we call them beta before. Um, now, instead of using this dot product, meaning just using the dot product where the points already live, which is very much controlled by sort of geometry um, of our space, we could use a more abstract function k, where k takes in a pair of points and spits out a number. Um, and then this is the thing which evaluates to every point it can provide some sort of some value. And that the value of that is how we decide on whether or not a point should be red or yellow. But the beautiful thing is we can step through different kernels in a very systematic way. So we had just looked at this example where that kernel was essentially just the dot product. That was the linear classifier. So when you write SVC kernel equals linear, you're looking at a linear classifier. But Additionally, you could look at radial. Radial is then, instead of taking the dot product of xi and xi prime, it's looking at, well, let's take their dot product, square it, and then make that the exponent of this some e to the minus gamma. And that ends up being the thing which actually separates out points that have good radial separation. So if you have data which you think has good radial separation, then you should consider using a radial kernel. Um, but of course, you can also generalize. And instead of using a linear classifier, you could use a curvy classifier. And that just comes from using a higher degree polynomial. So we basically take the result of our dot product and then take that to some d to power. And now you can choose d and view that as a hyperparameter that you can tune. So let's just go ahead and see how this works in the urban versus rural example, which was synthetically generated using the make circles function. So RBF is actually a scikit-learn's abbreviation for radial basis function. And so very beautifully, instead of using lines and looking at distances from that lines to define margins, we now have circles and nested circles as being the thing which defines our radial classifier and its margins. And notice again, we still had this sort of notion of softness, the idea that there might be some penalty. But here we try to set this somewhat on the lower side just so that uh, if we need it, but in this case we didn't. So that was a lot of examples. Um, and although you've probably seen a lot there are still much more, and most of this was taken from Van der Plaas. Um, and I encourage you to then look at his example where he essentially uses uh, a radial basis function classifier um, with pictures of politicians, George Bush, Colin Powell, Hugo Chavez, and then it sees how well it does in terms of prediction. Uh, it mispredicts and thinks Bush looks like Tony Blair um, in one of these things. Uh, but again, data science, involves both understanding the math and science and computer science behind all of this, but also there's an art of choosing what's the right way of featurizing your data, which SVM helps you do, but you still need to know how to use it. So I know it's been a long lecture. I appreciate your attention uh, and I hope to see you in class soon.